In times like these, we need faith that's victorious, and you can walk in it. Welcome to Victorious Faith with Pastor Mark Cowart. Hello and welcome to the broadcast. Good to be with you today. Uh, we've started a new series called The Power of a Surrendered Life. And oh man, this is a message I just desire people to get a hold of. I can't tell you how many times I've run into people that just really think their life is no count. It's not anything that can have an impact. And it's just not true. When you surrender your life to the Lord, your life takes on a shape and form and meaning that is incomprehensible and also reaches out into eternity. And so I want to encourage you to take advantage of our free book offer, uh, the little mini book entitled The Power of Forgiveness. You can download that free of charge and then we'll get the hard copy to you. And then also the daily broadcast is available in the formats listed on the screen. And then we also have what I minister live at Church for All Nations on our Sunday morning services. You know, there's just that whole different dynamic when you have an auditorium full of people, all different walks of life. And it always amazes me how the Holy Spirit speaks to so many people with just one message going out. And this message is one of my favorites. Um, we are studying about the power of a surrendered life. You surrender it to the Lord. You know, the bottom line is we're going to serve somebody in this life. You cannot exist without serving someone. You know, it may be yourself. Uh, you know, there's people that serve the devil directly and they proclaim it. And then there's those that serve the Lord. And when you really genuinely serve the Lord, God will do such powerful things. You know, I've always, in fact, you can go ahead and find Psalm 105 verse 17. We're going to go back to that scripture. I've always been amazed at how God took my, you know, I, I almost feel like saying my little pathetic nothing life that as I just had a heart to serve him, he turned it into something. And, and it was because I just desired to serve the Lord. I wanted to be used by God. I never had a desire to be a pastor of a church. Um, in fact, I never thought I'd be a pastor of a church. I have told the story that when I was about 14 years old, I was, you know, I used to go to Texas during the summers. Um, I'm from Texas and our family moved away in 1969. So I went to junior high and high school in Colorado. But during the summers, I got to go back and I would go back to my hometown up in the panhandle of West Texas. And then I would go down for about a month to my grandparents around Waco, Texas. It was outside. And those were the highlights of my life. And, um, you know, there were just uh, there were things that I tell the story when I was with my grandmother, my grandparents. And... Uh, I was sitting on the porch. It was so hot. They didn't have air conditioning. They would just leave the windows open and use fans. But in the evening or in the late afternoons and early evenings, we'd sit on the porch and let it cool down and then go into the to the uh, house uh, when it kind of cooled down. But we were sitting there one night and my grandmother, being a Lutheran, looked over and I didn't know to say this at the time. It was it was prophetic. It was me, my grandfather, and my grandmother. And she looked at me and said, I bet that Mark's going to be a preacher someday. And it was so foreign and alien to me, couldn't fathom it, wasn't anywhere in my uh, thought life. And yet that, she was seeing something. And even though they were a Lutheran family, they didn't have the baptism in the Holy Spirit, they did love God and they knew God. And uh, my grandmother was seeing something that um, I couldn't even fathom at the time. And, and so just out of high school, at the latter part of high school and, and just after high school, the Lord began to work in my life in a powerful way. And I sensed his call on my life and I just, it manifested in a desire to just serve him. So, you know, I would serve around the church and different things. And, and the bottom line, as I surrendered my life to the Lord, he began to use it and he could flow through it. 
And no matter what your life is, and I'm just sensing this right now, some of you need to hear this. There's so many people that they think their life's not that important and they think that God can't use them. And I am telling you this time that we're in, in the body of Christ, I'll tell you what, this is the time you're going to see the ordinary believer, if I can say it that way, begin to do extraordinary things. In 1 Corinthians 12, the whole body of Christ, or I'm sorry, the whole body of Christ, yes, um, is, is seen in the human body, how that it's made up of all these different, many and varied parts. And Paul says, the parts that we think that aren't that important, they're all the more important. The hidden body parts, the parts you never see are vital. That means necessary for life. You know, you never see your heart, your kidney, your liver, your lungs, but we all know they're important. They're vital for life. They're vital organs. It means you don't live without them. And a lot of times, you know, in America, we've fallen into this to celebrity trap. Um, and I've seen it in ministry where people, they get this celebrity mindset. And, and if we're not careful ministers, they, they get to thinking they're celebrity and people will make them a celebrity. I remember when Dr. Lester Summerall was alive, he said, just remember, Mark, he said, God will think or people will think you're either a God or a devil and they're wrong on both parts. And I have found that to be true. We are uh, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, members in particular in the body, and there's no big eyes and little U's. And man, when you get a revelation of that and that you're in there somewhere and that the same life of God that's in the head, the Lord Jesus Christ is flowing through the whole body and you realize you're important and you will just rest in that and be content in that and embrace whatever God has for you. I'm telling you, God will do great things and powerful things in your life. I've seen that as a pastor over the years. You know, I know, and I'm so grateful for the congregation at Church for All Nations. I think they're the best there are on the planet. And there's a lot of people in this church that pray for Linda and I, they pray for our sons, our grandchildren now, they pray for our staff, and then they pray for the body. And they don't always broadcast it. They don't always say, well, hey, we're praying for you. I just happened to find out about it. And I shudder to think if we didn't have people praying for us like we do. And let me tell you, that, that is a vital ministry that's never seen or noticed or recognized for the most part. But the effect of it is so powerful. And so let's get into our scripture here. Psalm 105 verse 17. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters, he was laid in iron until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. So Joseph is just this young boy and he gets these two dreams from God and they were directly from God. And he went from having these God given dreams right to the dungeon. And, you know, there's a question to think, did he miss it? I wonder how Joseph processed that. And then just about the time he thought it couldn't get any worse, it did. So he gets sold into slavery, ends up in Potiphar's house. And Potiphar, the favor of the Lord was on Joseph, even in prison. And Potiphar recognized it. And he began to entrust things to him. And then all of a sudden, we know that his wife betrayed him. She had eyes for Joseph. And uh, boy, you talk about a scorned woman. She, um, she went and made the move on Joseph and he said, I can't do that. He said, my master put me in charge of a lot uh, and over all his household, but you're not part of that. And boy, she didn't like that. And so she falsely accused him. And then Potiphar thought he was betrayed after he had trusted him. And so all of a sudden, you know, it got worse and then he, they, he was hurt in so many ways. But one of the things that we find is we can learn some lessons from the life of Joseph that your life 
has some microcosms from the life of Joseph that you will recognize. And I've said it this way often, if you don't understand the life of Joseph, you'll never understand your own life. Because a lot of times we get a prophetic word or we have a word from the Lord and we believe God's going to use us. And then all of a sudden we have these dreams and visions and then we head and it seems like we're in a dungeon. We end up in a prison. We end up stalled out. And this is where most believers miss it. They get impatient and then all of a sudden they alter their course. They cease to be surrendered to the Lord and then they go make changes and options. I've watched that in staff members over the years. Some of my most promising staff members and they got impatient. They didn't agree with certain things. And, you know, I, you know, the thing of it is we have to understand that we are serving the Lord and we are all about the kingdom. We're not about building ministry per se. We are kingdom builders. And because we are in a kingdom, we have to understand it's so different than a corporate structure, even though we use leadership principles that are used in corporations and things like that. You cannot forget that churches and ministries are not just corporations. They may be. We're a nonprofit corporation. We are the body of Christ. We are kingdom minded. So there's times in my leadership that I don't make what would be quantified or labeled as a good leadership decision because I'm a kingdom minded person. And, you know, people have to understand that uh, Jesus made a lot of decisions that weren't good leadership decisions by today's secular standards. And that's what Joe uh, drove Judas to betray Jesus. You know, there's a certain mystery about Judas Iscariot and, you know, he was a thief, number one. Judas was corrupt and yet he was walking with the Lord, serving. He was on the Lord's staff. He had a perfect boss and he's in hell right now. Judas, the Lord said about Judas, it'd be better for that man if he, if he wasn't born again. But I don't know if you've ever heard about this before, but Gordon Lindsay wrote a little bitty mini book years ago called The Mystery of Judas Iscariot. And up to that point, I'd never thought about it. But a lot of people think that Judas betrayed Jesus for the money, the 30 pieces of silver. And after I read this book, I began to see it in a different light. I don't think that was the case at all because you remember when he betrayed him, he ended up throwing the money back into the feet of those that he sold out Jesus to. And then he went and hung himself. And so a lot of it, you know, Judas was one of these opportunists and I've had these on staff before. It's all about what they can get, all about what we can do, promoting the ministry and stuff like that. And so they take on secular leadership principles. And here's the deal. Any good leadership you find in the world, principles and things like that, if they're good, they came from the Word of God. But if they don't have the kingdom overlay, the kingdom mindset, then it can become deadly to kingdom advancement and kingdom activity. And so what I think really drove Judas crazy was Jesus would go perform these miracles and then he'd say, don't tell anybody about it. And Judas was all about promoting the ministry. He wasn't focused entirely. He didn't savor the things of God. Peter didn't either. I mean, Peter in Matthew chapter 16 had revelation. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus turns right around and says, you are blessed, Peter, because flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. And I say unto you that I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. But then it isn't five verses later, the Lord had to turn right around to Peter and rebuke him and say, get behind me, Satan. Why? Because you don't savor the things of God. And so I guess you would say Peter made a good leadership call protecting his boss, 
Jesus because he, Jesus sat there and said, I'm going to have to go up to Jerusalem. I'll be given over in the hands of wicked men. They're going to slay me. Ah, Lord, that can never be. You know, Lord, we can't, we, we can't have that happen. And so the leadership instinct, the loyalty instinct in Peter said, Lord, I can't let that happen. And the Lord had to rebuke him. It was like Peter went from having direct revelation from God and within five verses, the devil used his mouth to try to intervene and stop and shut down the plan of God. And I believe that's part of the mystery of Judas Iscariot. He could not stand the fact that Jesus did not capitalize on the signs, the wonders and the miracles. Because you have to remember, he was the treasurer. He was stealing out of the treasury. And so he was an opportunist and he wanted to promote the ministry, but he was very corrupted and blinded. And so this is a conviction I have. I don't think he ever thought Jesus would go to the, his death. You got to remember, he saw that Jesus could never be trapped. They couldn't catch him. They tried to catch him in in questions, they would try to say things. Uh, you know, they tried to kill Jesus. He walked through their midst. You know, the Gadarene demoniac. I mean, the wind and the waves couldn't handle Jesus. Jesus handled the wind and the waves. So I really think that Judas got to a point, he's like, man, I just can't take this anymore. And he was believing that Jesus, when he betrayed him, he possibly thought that Jesus would not give himself over to be crucified. And when all of a sudden he saw what happened, he realized he betrayed the son of God. He betrayed innocent blood and that devil took him out and drove him to kill himself. And so a lot of times there's, there's leadership things that people do and it may be contrary to the kingdom of God. You have to be kingdom minded. And, and so one of the things that we find is that God was always working in the life of Joseph. He's always working in our life. And let's say, for instance, there have been times in years gone by, I've hired staff. We sought the Lord about the staff member that we brought on. And there was one in the last few years here. We, I thought, okay, we're going to do this right. As best as I could tell, this staff member is supposed to be on this, and but we went beyond and above. And, you know, we talked to them, their family, flew them out here. And I mean, we, every which way but loose, got them with all of our other staff. And I'll tell you what, if it wasn't a bad situation and a sad situation. And so one of the things is when you've done that and you've had bad eggs or bad apples, that you were a direct part of hiring them and bringing them in, man, you just can really beat yourself up about it and thought, I just missed it so bad. And there was no good that came out of that. And yet I realized this, there is never wasted time in the kingdom. Going all the way back when we had different staff members and bad situations, each time there were so many things happening. And I'm saying this for a reason because we're talking about some lessons from the life of Joseph. Because we think when Joseph got those dreams that within a week or so he was gonna be used, family would be bowing down and he'd be used to save a nation. But God sees the end from before the beginning and he had a lot of prep work that he had to do in Joseph. And so I've been in the ministry. I started attending this church in 1983. And so it was many years before I became senior pastor. I was associate before that. And then there are things that I received in a prophetic word that I shared December 3rd, 1978. We're just now getting into the perimeter of it and into the edge of it. And that's because the Lord has to do a lot of preparation in all of us. And there's, there's things where it says here, until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. That speaks of a, a, tr a fiery trial, so to speak. And I really believe you have to, have to remember, Joseph in the Old Testament, 
He was the most powerful man in all of Egypt. The only one above him was Pharaoh. But Pharaoh deferred to him and said, boy, you listen to what he says. God gave Joseph the interpretation of the dream that would save a nation of people. And all of a sudden you see that for Joseph to go into a place with that much power, you can't put a novice in there. You need someone that has steel in their soul, someone that has been tried by fire. In fact, I remember when the movie Lincoln came out, uh, I think it was 2012. And I remember our family was on vacation. We took a family vacation. We were down in Florida. And I remember we used to take, you know, our sons, all three of our sons, and then we'd bring a friend or two of theirs that we knew from church or something like that. And so I remember um, a couple of them, a couple of them were not feeling good one day. And we said, why don't you guys just stay home and rest? And then instead of going to the parks, you know, uh, all the different things and all that, we decided to go see a movie and Lincoln had just come out. And I'll tell you what, that was, that had me on the edge of my chair. And I was thinking of all the pressure, all the, the test, the trials, the heartaches that Abraham Lincoln had gone through. And I don't have it handy, but it talks about all the things he went to. I mean, he had difficulties in his marriage. He lost a child. Um, he had a nervous breakdown and he ran for several offices and failed. Um, he failed in business. And then here he is elected president of the United States. And <clears throat> now history, you can look back and see it. God was using him in this slavery thing to get rid of it. And it was the 13th Amendment. And I don't think I fully understand, understood the pressure and the intense heat that came on President Lincoln when he was up against abolishing slavery because it was embedded into the fabric of the country. And so it divided our nation. In fact, I think if there's anything that could have really destroyed this nation, it was a civil war. You had fathers against sons, brothers against brothers, family members against each other. And, you know, so many of them, they all believed in God. They believed the Bible. It was a blindness of heart. It's kind of difficult to wrap your mind around. And I remember in the movie, it was all those different things that Lincoln was facing. And I was literally on the edge of my chair thinking the pressure that that man went through. And I want to encourage you today because many of you, God has called you. There's a strong call upon your life and he has big plans for you, regardless of whether you're called into what we think of ministry, because we're all in full-time ministry. Some of you are in the mountain of business. Others may be called into the mountain of ministry, religion, education, family, uh, celebration, arts, entertainment, sports, whatever it is. But understand this, as you climb those mountains of influence in society, the spiritual warfare intensifies to levels sometimes beyond comprehension. And you need to be prepared for that. And so a lot of times when you are on your way to fulfill your destiny, you have to understand one of the most powerful tools in your arsenal is a surrendered life to the Lord. Don't take every open door. Don't walk through every open door. Don't take every seemingly positive offer as though that's the place you're to go or that's the offer you're to take. Because I remember <clears throat> when I got back to Colorado Springs and seeking the Lord, it was amazing the things that start getting offered to me because I needed a job. I needed to start making some income, even though I felt called to work in full-time ministry within a church or ministry context. And I had all sorts of things coming my way. I had people directly trying to hire me out of where God had placed me at that particular time. And it was only as I followed the leadership of the Holy Spirit that I believe I stayed the course and was able to stay because it wasn't always attractive where I was. It wasn't always easy 
where I was serving. And my life really took on shape and form in 1983 when I started attending this church that I'm now pastoring. And then I started being asked to do different things and I was brought on staff and it was a real small part-time pay. And one of the things that I believe kept me on course was I surrendered my life to the Lord. I made a quality decision that I would follow the Lord. I was in it to advance His kingdom and I wanted to fulfill my destiny. And it's the same for any one of you. The most important thing is don't look and compare yourself with those around you, but begin to seek the Lord specifically. Lord, what would you have me doing? Man, I've got so many stories I'm thinking of right now and we're out of time, but we'll get to them uh, during the next broadcast, several broadcasts. So let me just encourage you, take advantage of our mini book entitled The Power of Forgiveness. You can download that free of charge and then we'll get the hard copy to you. I really do believe if you don't understand the life of Joseph, you won't understand your own life because your life is a microcosm of his life. And then of course, there's a daily broadcast. If you'd like to get these broadcasts or these teachings, you can get those. They're available in all the formats on the screen. And then I also ministered this same message in Church for All Nations, and those are available, uh, those messages on the screen in all the formats, and you can uh, get those. But we encourage, you know, Dr. Summerall used to say all the time, if you'll just feed your faith, you'll starve your doubts to death. And so I want to encourage you to continue to feed your faith. If you're in the Colorado Springs area by chance, I want to invite you, if you don't have a home church, come join us at Church for All Nations. We have two locations and we would love to have you. And I also look forward to seeing you on the next broadcast. Till then, may the Lord bless you richly. Thank you for joining us for the Victorious Faith broadcast. Our hope is that the Lord spoke specifically to you through today's program. If you have any prayer needs, we have a team that is ready to agree with you in prayer. Just call the number below. We also have some amazing faith building resources, a mini book that goes along with this series, as well as the entire teaching series on CD, DVD, or USB drive for purchase. Visit the website, markcowart.org for more information and to place your order. And be sure to join us daily for more faith-based biblical teaching with Pastor Mark. We were so excited to be with you today. You know, partnership is a very powerful thing and it contains a spiritual element. You know what? We're going to continue to come to you whether you give into the ministry or not. But if you would like to partner with us, it will enable us to continue to expand and bring more materials and teaching to you. So I invite you to prayerfully become a part of our ministry by partnering with us. Visit our website, markcowart.org, and become a partner today.